right. So I'm here today with um, Dr. Michael De DeFuscia. Did I get that right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Awesome. And um, I found you via uh, your book, which is all about Owen Barfield. Um, and I guess this is your, your doctoral thesis yes. that you wrote yeah. on him. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I'd, I'd reached out to you. We've had a few conversations about um, Barfield and his work and um, your work rather. And, um, and so I just, I just wanted to spend some time chatting with you about uh, some of the questions I have about the book and, and learn. I, I feel like um, Barfield is one of these, these people that's, he's, um, he's interesting, but he, he's kind of poorly understood. And I thought um, engaging with your work was like the best, clearest uh, uh, clearest writing I've seen on it in terms of how, how he relates to um, some, um, some really key ideas. So I guess um, just to start things off, you know, if you could, we already chatted about this, but just how it is that, you know, you know, you got on this process where you you end up writing a, a doctoral thesis about Barfield. Well, yeah, um, it probably goes back to my master's degree. Um, I come from a, like sort of low church Pentecostal evangelical background. And I was wrestling with what I suppose at the time would have been a sense of, I, I now I would probably call it something like a very vague term would be dualism. The idea that like all around me, there seem to be factions um, in my theology or my, um, the way in which I understood God and, and um, my Christianity uh, seem to be very, in a sense, aligned with the logic of, of politics of the time, the logic of, I suppose, the, the world. Um, but I, I had a deep sense that if Christianity were real, it should be able to kind of have something to say about that logic, not entirely negate it, but fit within it and then kind of, as I would later probably term it, maybe out narrate it or um, bring it up or perfect it. And at the time I didn't have any language of course for any of this, but I suppose the existential sense that I was a, what I would probably now call a fundamentalist at the time. And then, um, or other term uses like foundationalist. So my God was based on a set of beliefs that, you know, I had created. Um, and what I was noticing internally was that this form of like kind of pietism led to a kind of despair that on, on many levels, rationally, of course, it doesn't work. Um, but existentially and spiritually, it wasn't working as well. And I suppose one of the main things that led me to begin to study this kind of, I suppose, dualism is how I would describe it now and how it didn't, I felt Christianity had to say more about this. Um, was the, the actual political ideologies I was seeing at a quite conservative um, school that I was attending, university for my master's degree. Um, and, and that was, I, I suppose, within me, I, um, that at the end of the day, I wasn't able, able to love, I suppose, in this. If God is love, here I was actually hating the other side. And I didn't like that. And that was kind of the existential moment for me that began this unfolding. But then there came this realization that, oh, the God that I had kind of constructed began to, to deteriorate at the same time. And this was towards the end of my master's degree. So I was sort of like, oh, this is what happens to every seminary student. This is what they warned me about, that I would lose my faith. And it cer certainly was a moment of crisis for me. Um, and it was at that time that I came across the work of a guy named John Milbank. Um, someone had given me an article that he'd written in Modern Theology years ago called uh, Postmodern Critical Augustinianism. And I sensed that this was a way forward for me that offered a more nuanced perspective that wasn't throwing kind of the baby out with ba the bathwater. It was a, a want for truth, but a mystical truth almost. Mm -hmm. um, a truth that was only found in God um, and, and a discourse that sort of really said something about the sign of the times, but also was uh, to me far more articulate and placed Christianity in a space that, uh, you know, could have conversations with, you know, the secular discourses and things like this, uh, honor what was honorable about them. And then 
and then kind of show how Christianity had something to say in all these different spheres. And so John's work was very pivotal in that. And it gave me a sense of, oh, okay, there's people thinking through these things that I, in ways that were far beyond my capacity, even today. Uh, and then I just sort of, you know, contacted John and started a dialogue with him and met him at Georgetown University. The next thing I know, my wife and I are over in England um, doing the PhD. And it was about eight months into that, I was working on, I had a deep sense again that went all the way back to when this started to unfold that um, the reality of the world, the things of this world, the things that we see, the things that we do, the, you know, the disciplines that we're involved in, the vocations we take on, should all kind of point back to God in some way, in a real, real way. But I had grown up in this kind of dualism where uh, yeah. you're kind of sacred secular. And, and what I wanted to do, I suppose, with John was explore that idea of what does it mean to see God within all things? Because this yeah. was entirely new to me as a, uh, a sort of low church Protestant. It was, it was entirely new. God was either inside of me or he was at church. And this was this very robust vision that I'm still continuing to learn. So as I say, about eight months into that, uh, it was very clear that I didn't have the educational background to do the sort of thing that I wanted to do with John. And he, that, at that moment, he said, well, a lot of the things that you're exploring has been taken up by Owen Barfield. And imagine this is eight months into my PhD. Uh, I, I feel like I'm being baptized into a world of Anglican Catholic thought that was entirely new to me. Very exciting. Uh, but had a, had a interlocutor like John, who's far exceeds me still to this day. There's an infinite qualitative difference. I always joke between John and I that will never <laughs> be passed, but, um, he was able to see, you know, uh, in one of his students named Adrian Paps was writing something like I would have liked to have written, but I, I still to this day couldn't write that. Uh, and it came out more recently. Uh, it's called, um, uh, I think it's called the metaphysics, metaphysics, the creation of hierarchy. I think Erdman's published it. It's a brilliant book. I, I cite it in my own work because it's been so influential. But, but, but to focus on Barfield, whom I've never heard of at the time, was a, obviously a shift, but nonetheless was giving me a, um, a project that I could do for a PhD that I was hopefully um, uh, intellectually capable of tackling, although Barfield is, is not easy. Yeah. Not, not easy to pin down because he's in so many areas. So that's what it was. And then, of course, this idea of participation, which was integral to John's work and then really integral to the entire patristic tradition that I'd never heard of until I went overseas to do a Ph.D., uh, that all things were kind of participating in God um, and, and that nothing is outside of God and God is sustaining all things. Um, this is a very robust God to me. Now, of course, Barfield doesn't quite mean that when he uses the term, but nonetheless, uh, he, he is kind of a segue, I suppose, into this more theologically rich tradition is kind of how I've read him and described him in my book, I, I think. Okay. And so you mentioned there that, um, you know, your engagement with John's work, that, that crystallized something in you that started you down this path. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit more broadly to, you know, what, so I guess he's, he's kind of sort of credited with uh, the founding of the radical orthodoxy movement. Yeah, yeah. Can you speak a little bit more broadly about like what, what that is and how that fits into this, this kind of change in your direction of thought? Yeah, I get asked that question all the time. And I mean, of course, radical orthodoxy involves a lot. Um, it, it dialogues with so many different disciplines and um, there's a lot of books out there and it's quite dense material. Usually people are, um, overwhelmed uh and i hear a lot of people kind of having different readings of it that don't seem to jive with the way i understand it i think at its core what john uh is or was trying to do and then the people that kind of caught this it, it, ethos like myself um was that they were it follows in what's called the catholic resourcement tradition which was trying to re retrieve the, the riches of the early church to as a way of understanding uh, as the sign of the times or it was a critique of modern kind of thought in in if i just go back to the idea of dualism although it's kind of an over abused term 
but the idea that there was a way uh, reality was was much more complex than the separation of of nature and supernature nature and grace and so john's work was always trying to get at the nuance or almost christological relationship between the natural and the supernatural which he sees as kind of pervading everything um but how that works out is similar to what you and I were talking about last time we talked. I think fundamental to that ethos is a paradoxical or you might say analogical worldview. You know, that, that's a big word. So what, what does that mean? It's a way of trying, it, however difficult it is to articulate God, um, it's a way, it's both a language and a metaphysic for a, a, an account of reality. So it's not the language separated from reality, but believing that language accords with reality, that, that, that reality itself is analogical, and therefore the language best are meant to articulate reality should be something analogical. And that's why I think for me, poetry becomes more a metaphor in Barfield stuff becomes a bit more, it's like it raises our discourse in a way that into a kind of realm in which we're, you know, whatever language you want to use, raptured or, or receive um, the world rather than dictating it. Um, but how that works out theologically in most spheres, as you and I talked about, you get this idea of God being utterly separate from his creation and that's true. That's absolutely the case. God is beyond being, all of that. But at, yet at the same time, Christianity has always held to the, 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 the very fact that God is in us and God sustains the creation. So how is it that we articulate that difference, yet that nearness to us? Um, and so in the theological, philosophical world, um, you can talk of that in terms of God's being being univocal to ours in some sort of sameness, even though he might be much greater than us, um, or equivocal to us. So we might use language that when I say the word father, that means that God is in no way related to my own earthly father. Um, to say univocal would be to say when I say father, it would be similar to uh, saying that, yes, in, there, in some real way, when I talk of my dad, there is a reference to, to God that I can draw from. So how is it that we articulate and how is it uh, the relation between God and creation? In, in Protestantism, um, you know, with Karl Barth, and you see a, a kind of rupture there. And in his dialogue with people like Balthazar, in his, his pushback against something like natural theology was a deep concern that if you didn't articulate that utter separation, the infinite qualitative difference as um, Bart would use drawing from Kierkegaard, then somehow you were, you were making God an idol. Uh, anytime we talked of God, um, vestiges of God within creation, we might um, be moving in towards an idolatry. So analogy in, in, in that form of doing metaphysics, uh, talking of truth analogically rather than on the one hand univocally or on the other hand equivocally where there's no correspondence, mm -hmm. um, goes all the way down. And for John, that's a kind of Trinitarian metaphysics. So uh, unity and difference. Uh, so it's a paradoxical way. And this can frustrate people because you want to have a kind of really clear vision of who God is on one hand. And then in the postmodern period, there's an anxiety about saying anything about truth or, 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 or anything and everything is sort of subjective. So what John was doing, I suppose, in the RO ethos was doing was giving a real powerful, strong kind of mode of truth or a metaphysic uh, that was quite forceful yet it was mystical at the same time. It, it was admitting to the fact that we can't fully articulate this, so we need to use a, a sort of language that can truly articulate the difference between God and creation, and yet his, his nearness to it. Um, so on the one hand, avoiding a strong deism where God is distant and intervened, kind of interventionist God, uh, and then as opposed to something like pantheism, that we're all God. So yeah. holding the tension between those, and uh, I think most of us see within the patristic tradition a holding those intention in the language. So 
so yeah, and, and then that goes down to things like dualism where spirit and matter, particularly in Barfield, are not sundered. Uh, it's just a perception we have today. Yeah, but they're right. much more integrally tied together. And that's what he means by participation. Um, and so as you might see this then begin to collapse the idea of secularism, which in John's narrative or his genealogy, he said this has to do with bad theology that happens in the middle ages that you get the idea of secularism a space outside of god and the, I, without going into detail about all that um i hope that kind of encapsulates yeah. where this all fits well you know one of the things that we we talked about previously um was was one of the consequences of this this sort of fundamentalism that you and i both kind of share in terms of our background is that it, it leads paradoxically to a very small god in some sense, which is, which is interesting because if, you know, if you take the, the text of the Bible, literally the, all the, all the propositions are there to create this large God, but then you, you have a conscious experience of something that's much smaller and is, as you said, confined to this very specific set of spaces, you know, that are quote unquote, you know, religious or sacred versus encompassing the whole world. I mean, I mean in, in, in running through all this stuff, has, have you, th have, have you come to any conclusions about why that, how that happens, you know, um, that, that this, you have these propositional statements about a God that's so, you know, wonderful, magnificent, et cetera, but then it's, it's, it's so disconnected from your everyday experience of the world. That's a really good question. And I wouldn't want to, you know, allow my own experience to cloud that of other people or how that sure. unfolds with people. But I, you know, um, a lot of the spiritual contemplative writers, when they're talking about spirituality, for instance, uh, Teresa of Avila, when she talks in the interior castle of the, the kind of different rooms or, or, or moments or stages uh, into the life of God and into union with God, the third stage tends to be the place that at least she and the contemplatives would talk of as a place we don't normally move beyond. And that tends to be that moment in which uh, we're acting for God, we're doing for God, we're trying to co construct this kind of like vision of God, uh, we're trying to grasp things and have it very clear. And somewhere between the third and the fifth stage, or the third and the fourth stage, most contemplatives who have this kind of hierarchy of and you have to be careful of talking of hierarchy because it's a letting go of the self, right? In the ego and all this, mm -hmm. um, to use a more contemporary term. But in that sort of space of surrender and going, oops, you know what? Like I thought I was climbing this ladder of sophistication or knowledge of God and all that. Um, it's very clear that to them between it kind of at that middle stage of spirituality where one comes closer into union with God, there is this, crucial moment that one kind of realizes like all of their activities and doings for God up to this point have have um, not fallen short but led to this place of a, a sort of mystical experience where to move forward into this is a kind of undoing of everything one knows and an unlearning. Nicholas of Cusa talks of theology as like a learned ignorance and I'm very platonic in that way too. Like the one who really doesn't know, knows something. And so reaching that kind of point, I think one either gets scared and retreats, I think, uh, because I did that for a long time. It's very scary to reach that threshold. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it, it can compromise relationships. Uh, it can uh, cause one to have to leave a certain church environment in, in, in or feel at least very out of place. Um, and so I would now, reflecting back at my own journey, see that as, as pivotal in the life of uh, journey into God, I suppose. Um, and I, I think in the language of contemplatives, one doesn't normally, it's quite rare for someone to pass over that. Mm -hmm. uh, by no means am I claiming I have. I, I sort of still be, I'm sort of still in that space where it's like, okay, finding God is not so easy to grasp. It's more of a letting go um, and it's funny because a lot of my book talks of active and passive, and only now is this becoming a spiritual thing for me. But in the same vein, the, the, the spiritual or contemplative tradition talks about moving from an active spirituality 
um, in doing things to one of passivity later in the later stages of, of just simply receiving um, in not imposing our own understandings upon God or even upon others. Uh, and so there's this tension between knowing and not knowing that I wasn't very comfortable with uh, early on in my spirituality. And I, I'm finding that it's in those moments of unknowing that I, I grow closer to God, if that, if that answers the question. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. Um, but it, what, part of what it made me think of, and I'm trying to connect a lot of different things together, so I may do this poorly, but um, th there's a sense of um, getting to that place of, of not knowing. It's, it's a sort of fundamental state of humility, um, you know, and, and a sort of recognition of that, you know, that infinite qualitative difference you were talking about between us and God and, I, is, is it in John's work that he talks about like, you know, all, all, all this, you know, the moment of revelation is always in is sort of in the act of worship, right? Like that there's a, and, and there's something about this sort of humility and, <clears throat> and having to come into some sort of, um, I don't know, a sort of overwhelming <laughs> sense of, of of how far short your your conceptions of God are, so that you can actually actually see something real instead of being blinded by your own ideas about who He is. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I wouldn't want to speak specifically for John, but I think this is his draw to some that to like uh, theurgy, which is uh, the idea that that one is kind of raptured. Um, I've seen the word used by a uh, a favorite theologian of mine named D.C. Schindler. Yeah, uh, I was going to bring him up. His su surprised by truth and yes, his... exactly it, the rupt. The idea, language he uses is Balthazar uses. I think is rupture. Um, and so when it, it, yes, exactly. So it's not that we all of these thinkers. The, I think most within the kind of RO sphere. Not I wouldn't say David Schindler is, and he's just a proper Catholic great theologian. Um, although he dialogues with John and these figures a lot, um, they have this idea that when you, um, that reason kind of reaches a, 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 an end. And in, in, in that moment of grace, or however one would want, I'm sure it's articulated differently. But the difference is that uh, uh, reason is perfected by faith, not done away with. Um, and this is something Thomas Aquinas says that a lot of them want to draw upon and so whereas a lot of the tradition i came from was when god's revelation comes it has no relationship whatsoever to our ability to accord or rationalize or think it just kind of utterly in a lot of religious traditions that is the case but what a lot of these figures would want to say is that faith or this revelatory moment is a, truly a rupture of our reason but yet on the other side of it it perfects our reason it brings us up to a knowledge that we didn't have before or it but it's more of an internal kind of knowing or a, a felt sense of um and when i teach this i always tell my students the very existential or spiritual point of this is oftentimes when we're wrestling with god it's because we have this kind of like odd paradigm and so we can't make sense of things um, but when that moment comes, whatever it looks like for anybody, uh, whether it's ecstatic or just kind of an aha moment, uh, I think we tend to go, oh, God, here's the problem. I thought you were this way, but actually, mm -hmm. this is who you really are. And so it's this deeper understanding of God that on the one hand undoes what we knew, but, but gives us a real truth uh, that we cling to, I suppose. And so, again, here's this paradox between unlearning something and in the very moment of unlearning we're learning and so i think that's probably roughly what um david schindler is getting at too his book um plato's critique of impure reason is as good as it gets along these lines i think it's called impure reason or pure reason anyway i always mix it up but it's a brilliant book yeah have you seen his his talk um i, I can't it's, it's on youtube somewhere where he, he's he's talking about how philosophy begins and ends in wonder yeah, that's, that's a really good uh, thing to keep in mind, too. Um, and I think this, ha this is linked also to not, not it, Schindler's work isn't, but, but theoretically, it's kind of linked to the, the Catherine Pickstock's work 
in that the consum like that that liturgy is kind of the consummation of philosophy it begins and then ends in this sort of like you say worshipful um expression i think the way we think of philosophy today is is very different than it it was for the ancients and i sure. hope for the christian tradition that it was in a sense of of wonder and i think one of david hart's works um i think it's the the more accessible uh um the one about uh, just uh, being consciousness in bliss i can't think of it the experience of god i think he he spells this out quite well that you um that that philosophy nowadays tends to ask the question of what something is uh not why something is in other words it's forgotten it's it's forgotten to wonder at the mystery of existence itself again the fundamental question is why there's something rather than nothing and then and then going from there not presuming there's something but why there is something and that i think is the question of wonder that's a real question yeah. of wonder uh that that begins at least in the platonic discourses of, of, of kind of an unfolding but also in plato this is always in concert with the divine uh, and this then feeds into kind of the, the the Christian ethos, I think, early on that like wonder, and in that the exploration of of truth or of God was something in, of an unfolding wonder, and there was never a moment in which one seized. In fact, to do that would be idolatry, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I, if I was going to summarize your book really quickly, I would I would kind of say that you, what you're trying to do is articulate this sort of uh, poetic philosophy of Barfields, but then go a step further and try and look at like what um, what are the ontological significances of of, of this way of, of uh, viewing reality. Would would you agree with that or, or clarify that yeah. in any way? Yeah, I think you know I'm still learning about Barfield, and I wouldn't claim that the book is in any way definitive <laughs> um, because I, you know, there's so much there. I think because of the theological world in which I inhabited when I was writing this, I wanted to, it's very obvious that people would, that would know that world would say, oh, he's trying to draw Barfield into that orbit. So yes, I, I was, it, but, but to me, that theological discussion right now was kind of, I suppose, on the cutting edge of, of, of where, the history of kind of human thought was and then to bring Barfield into that sphere and say what does he have to offer this and what what is lacking I suppose in the fifth chapter I'm trying to get out what what is lacking in his work but yeah um, I suppose I try to paint him as someone who never passes through the modern enlightenment period who's pushing back on that um, his entire life he never in in that 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 in how that comes to be, I I don't really know, but it, it you you find within the tradition, and again, Adrian Papp's work does really well at at kind of linking this kind of this kind of uh, lineage that never falls prey to the kind of rationalism that uh, comes to define our times, even mm -hmm. today. I he mean, engages with Barfield in his work as well. I doubt it, but he's, yeah. he's more, I don't think he does it all. He might have a footnote, but yeah. it's all, no, it's very rich philosophical, theologically uh, located in, in the philosophical and theological traditions of the West. And he kind of traces this, what, what we might call uh, um, a, a tradition that never kind of falls prey to that. And so Barfield for me did see, see this. And I think even his tensions with Lewis, if one could call it, that had a lot to do with at least early on Lewis's high rationalism, um, and Barfield never, um, never uh, went, went down that path. So that's why I think he had something unique to offer, um, yeah. as eccentric as he can be at times. Yeah. Right. Um, so I have a little quote here that that kind of I think from the book that that delineates. Barfield's trying, you're, you're trying to lay out how Barfield kind of has this idea of the bridge between the objective and subjective uh, within, within this poetic philosophy. And uh, the quote is, uh, this inspired poetic utterance allows the subject to exceed the strictures of a pure philosophy precisely because the subject is not a ground in him or herself, not purely active or passive, but is situated in a medial realm 
through which he or she paradoxically receives from the divine in the act of naming or speaking or naming. And um, I'm curious, you know, could you speak a little bit more to like, you know, like this, this sort of medial space? Cause I think it's, it's, it's this, again, it's, it's about, you know, it links back into Coleridge and the, the polarity and all that, but it's, it seems that this seems to be the core of what Barfield's trying to accomplish in all his works, but he's, he's always trying to come up with different examples, different things to try and force you to accept that this is a reality, this, this middle space that we actually live in. Yeah, I think you're you're exactly spot on. I think that is a good summary. Not my I'm not saying the quote you read, but what you're saying this seems to be the key of to to I think to understanding uh Barfield. And I think you picked one of the most dense quotes in the book. <laughs> uh I, that must be towards the end. I I think or no. No, is, this is, is actually this is actually your I think this is actually your introduction. Yeah. I just found this one wow, recently. Wow. I Yeah, so so what so the, I should probably start with the middle voice. So in Catherine Pickstock's work, um, who was very influential in pointing me in this direction long before I'd even, you know, knew what that meant. Um, we don't have a middle voice verb in our language. Um, we don't use it. In, in fact, I think only in maybe Norwegian language, I can't remember right now, contemporary language, do they use the middle voice? So there's been post like Gadamer, and I think, I know Gadamer has looked at it, but there's been a little exploration of the middle voice. And so to place it in contemporary modes, like if you think of the modern period, there, we, the humans sort of rise up, the, 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 and we start naming things on our own. We no longer listen to things. We say, well, we should use that tree for paper uh, or, or something like that. So in other words, we start imposing our will. This is a Nietzschean kind of narrative, but nonetheless, I think most people would agree with, with this. Um, we start actively kind of imposing our will. So we become very active. And then in, in, after Nietzsche, this idea of the will to power terrifies and in some, terrifies most of us because uh, we we go oh maybe he's on to something so now what well then the phenomenological tradition which emerges out of this and this is why i use heidegger as an example in the work is this utter passivity now so it's like ooh, i don't want to offend anybody i don't want to hurt anything i don't want we've ruined everything so i should say nothing about anything and in fact the truest poetry the truest art the truest is totally subjectivity it has no meaning whatsoever it crosses over into this abyss so on the one hand this very forceful truthfulness objectivity and in post-modernity again i'm simplifying this a great deal so i'm going to get in trouble for doing this but i try to spell this out in the book is post-modernity is kind of founded on this idea of the passive subject and um What's interesting is that even in, in Greek, obviously, there's a middle voice. And so the middle voice is not only situated somewhere between this receiving and saying something real about things, but it, what is unique about the middle voice, and I think it's in the last chapter, I just spend a little bit of time on this, but it's Catherine Pickstock who pointed me to this. There's an article by a guy named Jan Gonda written years ago that when he's studying the middle voice, particularly in Greek, it always has this kind of theurgic element to it. So it's on the one hand, a, uh, a receiving of the world. It's on another hand, an articulating of what it is, but that is kind of only done in participation with the gods. So I'm kind of stretching this. So it says some, the middle voice not only kind of suspends these two things in a real way, uh, but it also um, has something to do with a connection to the divine as well. And so in Catherine's work, she takes up this in, in her after writing. And that's the first time I'd ever heard about it. But in Barfield's work, which, which of course jumped out to me, is when he looks at the word phenomenon, and I can't remember, it's, I think it's in Saving the Appearances. He, he translated, translates it in the middle voice. And so... 
this is very interesting to me, of course, because then it ties in with this idea that we're neither active nor passive or, but it fits exactly as you say with, with Coleridge trying to work out at the time, this objective subjective thing, particularly in romanticism was really important because we didn't want to see nature as purely objective and then the mind is purely subjective. They wanted to see nature living and in, uh, in, in a sense, subjectivity in the world, a participatory world view in which when we're actually seeing things, we're saying something real about the thing. It's not just qualitative over quantitative or mind over matter, but mind and matter are everywhere suspended and held together. So the middle voice uh, had, had both to do with an, a way of articulating uh, this space between modernity and postmodernity, but also uh, an almost theurgical or, or, or in some, maybe a Christian way. And one of the things that Catherine had mentioned, and this is very, again, very much the case in spirituality, Paul's language, and I could be wrong on this, and I don't want to misquote her, but Paul often talks of prayer using the middle voice. So it's not, it's like Christ praying through us, right? The Psalms, that's what the Psalms are. Uh, and so this makes, to me, you know, years later, as I'm studying more into contemplative spirituality, it, it's more, even more exciting. It's like, here we are, this active, passive element within spirituality, which we all recognize. We all mm -hmm. go, oh, no, God did that. I didn't have anything to do with that. Like, if we're really pious, like, right, right. oh, no, it's all God. And then the other, yeah, the other end of that is like, no, I did that. I was, I, yes, I was empowered by God, but I've worked my way up the ladder and I'm yeah, holy, yeah. holier than thou. And so it's always somewhere we wouldn't, yeah, this active passive thing was. And so I think the middle voice, although we don't have it in our language, it would, it's interesting to, to think on those terms. So I, again, that's a long answer, but I hope yeah. it helps to make sense. Well, yeah, it, it, it's interesting because it's like, you know, uh, we got to spill a lot of language <laughs> to try and describe this thing that we don't have. Cause as, as you pointed out, it's like, we, the, both in the modern and in the postmodern discourse, there is this sort of either ordness. It's like, you got to go this way or that way. Like there's this, the, 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 the polarity that Barfield's trying to articulate, I do think kind of looks beyond modernism and postmodernism to say, okay, no, you have to recover this sort of wholeness. Yeah. Cause you know, even within the postmodern frame today that I feel like does has definitely dominated the Academy and, and the, like um, the social sciences and, you know, humanities and such there's um there's a weird sort of um rational rationality in there as well it's very tight it's very simplistic it's doesn't even even while they are and, and this is you know like i mean when i was growing up um my parents sent me to like camps and things to try and try and prepare me not to be indoctrinated by postmodernism of course the thing they say is like okay you know postmodernism's claim is that there is no truth but that they're claiming that that is an absolute truth. So that there's a, this sort of, which, <laughs> yeah. which you actually, you do find in the work. If you boil it all down, like you, you always end up in that same dichotomy. So um, anyway, I, I, I'm, so I'm wondering, you know, did you, did you find anything in Barfield that was helpful for you personally in terms of escaping that sort of like either or that kind of helped you in terms of your conscious view of reality see okay there's this there's this there's a way i can stitch these things together and they can coexist yeah um uh that's a that's a good question i think in terms of my own life while barfield might have given some uh kind of like rational i don't or you know, um, super rational explanations of these things. I don't think any of that change in vision happens by an intellectual pursuit. Yeah, I think, I agree. I think it introduces it introduce. I think it held me captive. I think, in a good way. In other words, at least there was something out there when I, because let's face it, if I was a fundamentalist, I was already a rationalist. So here was a form of, of, of intellect that 
that allowed space for mystery a lot. And so that was intriguing to me in mm-hmm. and of itself, but how that goes from still really a construct or a, an abstract principle to um, being, becoming a habit of life or a way of perception. Um, that is not a question that I'm, I feel qualified to answer. Yeah. Although I would think it has something to do with, as a Christian with prayer yeah. um, in, in liturgy. Uh, and I don't think we attend to that enough. I certainly don't. Uh, so to answer your question, I'm still a fundamentalist and I'm still a rationalist and I'm still, uh, I still see things in dualistic, but I can tell you why I shouldn't do that. And I can yeah, tell you yeah. why it's actually incoherence. It's utterly yeah. incoherence and I can have those conversations. Um, but the slow unfolding of that within me. And I suppose some people probably find that differently. Maybe it's the other way. It's a spiritual thing first and then a sort of, but hopefully one day all these will somewhat uh, be integrated in me, but uh, it's just a slow unfolding. I, I, I don't know if that's what the kind of question you're asking or, or if I'm answering. Yeah. Well, it. you know, I, as soon as I said it, I realized, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat as you. Like I, I do find Barfield's very helpful for framing the problem and making you see that the incoherence. Yeah. But, but in terms of like, you know, what, what's the solution for What's the path to his quote unquote final participation. That's always kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Op- open-ended because he's 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 spilling so much ink just trying to get people to see what he's talking about yeah, yeah. that he i don't know that he you know it's, it's unclear what uh what he perceives as, as a path forward to kind of to to move to change consciousness you know that's that's a that's a real difficult thing you know i i sent you in uh, an email last night where this just occurred to me about um jonathan pajot's work who's he's this uh you know eastern orthodox icon carver and He's gotten fairly popular. He was actually, um, somehow his popularity came about because he was uh, friends with Jordan Peterson. Okay. And um, he, um, but he's coming at it from a, such a different perspective. And in this sort of symbolic perspective, I feel like is, is a way of trying to um, explicitly give you propositional statements that, um, that help you see the way these sort of patterns play themselves out everywhere in reality at every layer of reality that this sort of his, his quote is symbolism happens. It's this coming together between heaven and earth. Like there is, there is the, the materialism that, as I mentioned, like I'm still a materialist in, in some like fundamental ways that I can't, it's hard for me to shake. And yet it's it, like, as you said, it's incoherent because there's these invisible realities that are driving everything. And so I think what, what Jonathan is doing is trying to show, he's trying to kind of educate conscious your consciousness to see these everywhere. Um, a lot of what he does is he goes into really old stories, like very old fairy tales and shows here's what, here's how these things reflected a, another reality. Like, Oh yeah, it's a good story and that's why it survived. But it's also, it's communicating something larger about the structure of reality. And, and, um, and so like, you know, for me, like I can talk about how, you know, Jesus is the logos and this is like, the fundamental structure of everything, but I don't, I don't have a toolkit to kind of experience that in terms of how I see things laying out. I go back into my, um, you know, my other, you know, quote unquote smart ways of thinking about things that I think, you know, my, I'm smart and I'm going to, I'm going to power through this with some rationalism and and get the right answer. Um, so, um, but yeah, so I, 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 what's funny is I, I always find insights, coming into his work, but I, I can't, I, I haven't found a way to internalize that, that perspective. It always, it always sounds like he's coming at things and he sees something real. And I'm like, but I don't understand how he's doing what he's doing. Like, I'm like, yeah. what is this perspective that you have? Yeah, I, I agree. I think the wrestling with how one gets that vision to go all the way down is, is a lifetime of, of learning and of growth, I suppose, or, um, but I think what uh, you said, iconography, for instance, is is certainly a way that a lot would say the Eastern Church avoided um, the kind of idolatry. The irony that the the icons are the very thing that uh, suspend idolatry yeah. because we learn to see through them, right? And so again, here's this paradoxical tension that in 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 getting rid of icons, all of a sudden everything becomes an idol. Yeah. Um, 
rather than learning to see through them to God. So I, I think art, that kind of art, uh, is one way. I, I think increasingly I have a friend who, uh, is really on to this, this Irish poet named David White. Uh, I don't know if you've heard his name, but he is phenomenal. Um, and so is he still alive? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And he's, he's become kind of like, a. I don't know, really popular now. I think he's done a TED talk, but um, his, his poetry uh, is so deep. And there's something about that language that doesn't fully articulate what, what we know to be true. Um, mm -hmm. I think that helps me, I suppose, you know, have those moments of what, you know, real transformation, I think, where this vision continually deepens. Um, uh, my friend who loves David White I, is, is himself I, I, a good poet. He, he, um, he, uh, he'll often like call me or say, hey, I've just written this, like in, I'm, I'm not a poet. I, w I wish I could be. And I'm too much, too rationalist, I think. Um, but the, the most recent poem he read to me, which I don't remember much of it all, but it just talked about, um, he's just become a new dad and the relationship between father and son. But one of the things in my response that I think hit me so powerfully about it was that it could be read on so many levels. The metaphor that he's talking about could be about relationship with God uh, in me, it could be read about myself and I don't have a child, but if I had a child or a father and a son, but also about me and my truer self or however one wants to articulate that or um, myself in God. Um, and, and what struck me about the way that that hit me in the sense of, of God's nearness to me in that moment had much to do, I think, with the fact that I could not rationally take his analogy or his metaphor and go, Oh, he's talking about a father and son. Boom. I'm mm -hmm. done. I can move mm -hmm. on. He's, it, it was that it, it, it had like this um, holographic kind of like yeah, vision yeah. that I couldn't quite pin down. And it was that very thing because I couldn't rationalize it, that it made the most sense to me. I suppose someone who's rationalist or a logician listening to this conversation would be vomiting right about now, <laughs> but I'm talking about a kind of internal knowing um that that is is much deeper and situates us within the world within the people around us right. um that really grounds us and in, in, in to me makes me feel that god is very near to me and for me right. this is the christian god in yeah. christ uh yeah but, like, but for others yeah it may not be it's interesting it's like it's it's yeah we it's like yeah that that internal knowing that you you have to to consider yourself smart in the modern frame you have to dismiss Right. Or at least you got You got to put it very low in your hierarchy of, of, of how you make decisions, how you explain yourself, um, et cetera, to, to, you know, and, and what's funny is like, you know, we, we've gotten very, very good at pretending to be objective, I think, you know, because obviously, you know, again, if, if, if we were really objective, like, you know, <laughs> Not nothing, none, nothing. You couldn't explain anything we do from from an objective, quote, rationalist point of view. And so, but we've gotten very good because there's so much status connected to it, pretending <laughs> that oh yeah, I'm I'm being objective here. I'm you know, and I you know I I, I find myself doing that a lot as well. Um, and so it is it is hard to make those movements away from it until these sort of the, yeah, I do find for myself, it is, is often through art, um, you know, stories, movies, things where like something about that allows me to get outside of myself and, and see that, um, there's something really deep here that is present all the time that I'm, I'm overlooking that I'm just walking right past, even though it's right, it's there next to me. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think like, I think I might have mentioned this in our last conversation that um, I in reading books right now on spiritual direction, they say a lot of the people who um, are kind of at this point where they desire spiritual direction and deeper union with God are those kind of on the fringes or the outskirts of, of yeah. the church. Yeah, um, because and so 
I think people do who are having the, who are at this, I would say like third stage of spirituality, like we've kind of been, we've wrestled with ourselves, I think, is actually to encourage them to explore in those areas where they're finding meaning. Because inevitably, I think with, with proper guidance and with the right, you know, you know, encouragement, that, that's going to lead one back. It, it certainly did to me back yeah. to God yeah. um, through the mystery. Um, at some point, I think, yeah, we need to try to walk away from that construct that we've, we've created. But, but I also, you know, objectivity can be very good as well. There are very good things about it. So the sciences have done absolutely incredible things with an empiricist method. Yeah. And so I, um, that thing, I want to be clear about that, that um, science has done incredible things, um, engineering, the things that we've done. Um, there, there are so many beautiful things that have come out of this. So many lives saved, lives changed, uh, all good things. Um, I think the only thing I would want to avoid is, is assuming that that method of, of or technique becomes a, a, that method for, for, looking at things, objectivity or empiricism. Um, my only angst is when that becomes a, a, a metaphysic, uh, mm -hmm. a description of all of reality. So as long as one is clear that, yeah. you know, that, that that's, uh, there's a certain time for objectivity and it's, it does a certain thing, then yes. Because if that's the only vision, then it, like you say, it doesn't accord for the human side of us at all. Um, it's hard to talk even of yeah. human at all. And, and that's why the humanities, I think in general, because we're over kind of emphasis because all the money's in the science, the humanities suffer. And, and in a sense, we suffer as a result of that. Um, and I think Barfield was on about this sort of thing too. Do you, I'm curious, do you feel like, um, do you feel like technology itself is morally neutral or do you think it has this sort of, um, some sort of bent in it that almost always leads it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I suppose it's like anything. I mean, techne, I, I go all the way back to Aristotle. I think we talked about yeah, this in your, cha your chapter four was all about the difference between divine and human making. Yeah, and Marfield's I, perspective yeah, I, was kind of like, you know, hey, like we're almost necessarily going down this path going to destroy the world. <laughs> yeah. Barfield is quite cynical about it. The inklings you kind of wonder with the industrial revolution, Tolkien seems certainly concerned about it. Yeah. I think a lot of people post sixties were concerned about it. I think there's a lot of people who, who, who still are. Um, I mean, even in the most basic level, like we, we kind of know that we're being watched by our iPhones and we wish we could get rid of them, but we can't. Um, but uh, techne, I think, um, you know, it's always been human making, right? Since Aristotle d defines physis and then techne. So physis is nature, the word we use for nature today, which is a kind of like natural making, like the most natural thing I can do is make a baby. Um, yeah. There's nothing more profound than that. And I think as long as we remember our techne, our human artifice is distinct and will never be as, um, I suppose self-moved is what Aristotle would describe physis. Like a baby is self-moved in a way that no other thing a human can make artificially could ever do. As long as we are understanding that distinction, I think we're technology should, should move along. Um, I think it's when you get a confusion that when we think that the things we make are an escape from nature or, we've we've kind of like done something better than nature mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that's when we get ourselves in trouble and that's why i will always point to the aristotelian distinction between physis and uh techne uh which yeah you're right i i do that in chapter four although i'm reminded that when i did my defense Catherine pickstock was my my outside reader um and she was very very concerned about how she kind of looked at me like, you've been reading too much Barfield. You sound very cynical about technology. Um, and I was just kind of like, oh, that's not what everyone should be thinking. And yeah. she, you know, because it was just, that's what I, all I was reading for the past yeah. like, three, three or four years. Uh, and so that's how I suppose, you know, six years later, I would say um, technology, like for instance, this, we in COVID, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't communicate this way. This is a great gift, I think. Yeah. It can be used towards a good end. But does this replace you and I sitting down and having a coffee together? No way. 
that yeah. anyone would say that, but right. it, it, it's sufficient. Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah it's interesting. Cause I, I find myself going back and forth too. Like I, I would say I, at points in the past, I had a sort of naive optimism about technology. Um, I work in tech, so I, and you know, um, that's, that's partially why, but, um, but then I go back the other way where I'm like, I, I see it as only kind of necessarily going bad because one of the things that I, I do see that, and I think even Peugeot says this, he, he equates technology to kind of like these sort of dead layers that, that, that we kind of put on ourselves. And, and one of the consequences I see of that is it just, it, it produces a sort of um, complexity that um, if it isn't well managed, it, it gets out of control. Like it just, it becomes, it becomes kind of it, this this part of our our culture, and um, because it, it, as you pointed out, there's so much money attached to it now too that it it really it has it definitely has a life of its own. Um, that um, that if it if we don't um, if we if we aren't diligent with it, in which I, a lot of times I, I feel like we're getting less and less diligent with how we how yeah. critical we are in our approach to it. Um, then, then it definitely has this kind of ability to kind of run off the rails um, really quickly. So yeah, I, I, I kind of go back and forth on that because I, I still, I, my, my thinking is that, you know, if, if technology is the problem, a lot of the solution is going to have to come through some sort of technical element as well. Um, but um, like, you know, when I, when I think about like, so like the big companies like Facebook and Amazon and, and Google, um, the ways in which they are using technology, it, it's, it's, it's a sort of view of the future where I think um, their ideal future is like these sort of AIs that have figured out humans so completely that they can mm -hmm. just pull us, pull our strings like puppets, you know, that would be, and I don't think anybody would articulate that statement, but, but it's incrementally where their vision of the future is leading them towards. Um, yeah a lot about this from i have friends that are quite uh involved in like conspiracy theory stuff about big tech which i was completely unaware of and i don't think much about it that often um to go back i think to the question of the moral neutrality of it um heidegger thought that it was uh an epoch he just called it like it was this kind of way of seeing that emerged um in the of course in the modern period um uh a way of see, viewing reality and therefore treating it a, a certain way taking things and making them towards a certain end um and then and then you get like in a student i don't know if you know the names uh hans hans Jonas, i think yeah hans Jonas, h a n j o n a s was a a student of Heidegger's um, who said, no, it's not morally neutral. Uh, and he wrote a lot of books on describing uh, these, uh, not necessarily why it's not morally neutral, but that um, it has a certain bent that in some ways has removed morality from the picture. So in other words, if you, if you take a, an empiricist kind of technological stance about things, and then you end up reading that in one second, I need to open my door. Oh, no worries. Sorry, I had to let my, my dog out. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. If you end up reading that, that vision into all things, again, taking a methodology and making it, 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 it can appear quite sinister actually, because uh, to do the sorts of things I have to do on the one hand uh, with um, what we call like uh, Graham Ward calls this. I think he's the one that calls it like the transmigration of the good. So you have to take. Um, so, so the good, the true and the beautiful are no longer fixed, like in a sacramental vision and it has to move and migrate from one thing to another. And this is what drives our desires. And so the base, the, who does this the best Mac, as far as I know, well, uh, they, you know, people stand in line forever to get the new iPhone because that's the new good. And the old one, like yeah. literally falls apart. And, you know, 
the best way to do this is going to a thrift store. Like they're just stacked with like old technology that's completely useless because the good has migrated and moved on. And in, yeah. in technocratic stuff, you, you, you can do that. But in the natural, that's not how things, that, that doesn't change. But if that's read then back into humans, then that's where it starts to become quite troubling, I think. Uh, and so upholding this kind of uh, thing in which things are fixed, they're, they're, they're sacramental, they're, they're, uh, they have essences, real essences and ends towards which they should be used. Um, that's one thing. And so as long as our making isn't compromising that, um, and then obviously a lot of what uh, drives our society today has to do with uh, kind of taking our desires, which are meant to, to, to good, our desires to consume, that can be a very good thing, and turning it into like, oh, this is the new thing. You, and it's all based on kind of like you say, money and selling and um, so one today, if you're involved using technology, if you're using, say, social media, you have to be a pretty virtuous person to be able to handle all of that pool, yeah. all of that draw. And because I'm not virtuous enough, that's why I don't have social media. <laughs> um, I've recognized it as like, wow, I'm not like, um, I'm not holy enough to to live in this space by any means like i I have enough trouble with like a daily life of of prayer and and trying to connect with god like uh, that adding that to it is just like i don't know how and there i'm sure there are people that do it just fine do it really well um but but yeah and so for me it's just kind of like wow and again that technology isn't necessarily sinister it yeah uh, it, it can be but yeah yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's going to feature heavily in wherever whatever happens next here. Yeah. Um, I have a sort of longish quote I wanted to read from from your conclusion and get you to react to it. Um, so bear with me here, real quickly. Um, so this is uh, this is from the final chapter. If Barfield's theory of the evolution of consciousness is at all tenable, then perhaps this poetic aesthetic never truly died. It may even perhaps make a conscious return. Indeed, its vestiges live on not only in one subconscious, as Barfield would have it, but also in a tradition that Barfield himself largely ignored. In fact, this poetic aesthetic is becoming increasingly tenable as the search for truth, albeit speculatively, commences in the wake of postmodernity. In light of this, in the context of, in which it emerged, and in the contemporary discussion regarding the relationship between philosophy and theology, Barfield's poetic philosophy is significant because it turns philosophy away from an imminent trajectory and back towards its fulfillment and theological transcendence. For it will be argued that only a theological language is capable of expressing philosophy's limits while paradoxically gesturing beyond them navigating between a totalizing grasp of being and relativism. This worshipful utterance, conceived as a perpetual finite grasping of the infinite, is the only possibility of becoming, i.e. forward movement. Um, can, you, can you just elaborate a little bit on that and like what, why, it, why, why Barfield shows us that, maybe, maybe even unintentionally, that we need theological language um, to really to, to really move forward in terms of our, our philosophical understandings. Yeah, I, I, I probably would change the forcefulness of that quote now that I'm years out. Um, that sounds a lot like a, a Milbankian way of saying things quite, quite direct. Um, I think that what Barfield had to has to offer is this real question he really pushes the bounds of eminence um the idea that everything that we know and learn is in the here and now and we it's not received or it doesn't come from you know fundamentally if you're a christian you would say you would say the transcendent god Mm -hmm. And so in all of Barfield's work, there's kind of this um, dimension, you might say, 
that you you might call sacramental, but the idea that when we're going about things, when we're perceiving things, when we're talking about truth, when whatever it is we're doing, there's something quote unquote more than meets the eye going on there. Mm -hmm. And when I say he's kind of gesturing towards this theological vision, that's what I mean by that. He doesn't really, maybe later in life he gets more on this, um, but uh, he doesn't ever come out and say, oh, this is, he's not as forceful as like a theologian might be. But at the same time, in a post-truth era, do, people don't want that sort of forcefulness. Like they don't, they're, they're very anxious about a forcefulness of truthfulness of talking in terms of like, no, like that statement I just made, like the only way forward, uh, that, that, the, the notion of way forward, um, what I was kind of playing on is the idea of, of progress. Like we're, we're so caught up in the idea of progress right now. And it's kind of like, what do you mean by progression? But I suppose I'm talking about humans in our humanness, our human nature of progressing, not so much in an evolutionary, like we become bigger and stronger, but um, perceiving things perhaps as they are. If uh, I think a lot of people would say we're, we've regressed um, depending on what you do. And, and if we were to make some kind of progress or return as the language of someone like maybe Lewis or um, Barfield would use, then it would involve um, this kind of divine dimension because on the one hand, our attempts to secure things failed us miserably, but we're also just not utterly passive recipients. So this idea that of Tolkien's as being, this is all inkling stuff of being sub creators, like finding that middle space where we're doing the will of God, I think is something we've really ignored. How that relates to say even public discourse today. Well, something I'm involved in right now is really asking the question was like, is like, what does Christianity have to offer our time? Like in a real way, like you mm -hmm. look out and there's po uh, po political upheaval that we haven't seen in, in my time. Uh, and, uh, you know, with COVID and, and, and all this in the protests, um, what does it have to offer? It's kind of like, uh, well, something that keeps emerging for me when I ask that question, and you brought this up earlier, is, is it offers humility. <laughs> it offers, I don't have answers or, and, um, I don't need this, um, but it offers some type of vision of unknowing, actually, of saying, like, well, I don't have all the answers. Like, I don't know the truth. I don't yeah. know. Um, and, and in that is kind of that that's kind of transformative, I think. And so this kind of ability to be a passive surrender and not see ourselves as the end all be all of things, um, that there's something bigger, greater that, that can speak to us. If that is the case, then it would be good to attend to that, um, whatever that looks like. I mean, to me, it's prayer, prayer. Um, yeah. And so, uh, and then allow that to shape us in, in, in a transformative way, I suppose. I, I'm getting much further than I'm trying to get right now than I would be saying in the book. Um, in the book, what I'm just trying to articulate is that... Um, Postmodernity is very clear that, that uh, modernity failed. Um, yeah. and, and it's right, rightfully so. It's critique of that kind of logic yeah. is very, very uh, profound and needed to be done. It needed to be undone. Yeah. Um, but now, is it just merely a critical? Is it just really a critique? How do you build moving forward? Because uh, that, that's kind of what I'm suggesting. Like, how do you build in a post-truth area, er, area, era? would be something like, I think, uh, one in which we look beyond eminence. Because if there's one thing that these two spheres have in common, it, it is that they, they, they absorb transcendence into eminence or that, that things are just as they are here, take it or leave it. Either we're utterly wrong about them or we can know everything about them. Yeah. And there seems to be something more mysterious again there um and this is why this kind of idea early on of, of what john milbank was trying in following the resource malt tradition trying to retrieve the riches 
of the church. Can you still hear me? Is it still yeah. working? Okay, yeah. it said I was signed out, but trying to retrieve this earlier vision where transcendence and eminence are constantly held in tension, yep. the na nature and supernature, um, it seemed a retrieval of that in a new way uh, was, was vitally important to me, I think. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Like, so one of the things that, one of the tensions that, that came to mind while you're talking about all that in terms of like, what does Christianity have to offer? I, I, one of the things that, that I feel like the attention that, that is consistently come up when I'm reading Barfield is this sort of like the role that like God's sovereignty in, in our free will play oh, and how okay. these play out. And I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on, on, what Barfield has to say that. And, and I do think at times reading Barfield, I come away feeling like sort of maybe even overwhelmed with my own responsibility to kind of help everything course correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's similar to what you and I were talking about. That is a, is a real point of critique against mm -hmm. Barfield. I think you're very astute pointing that out. You, on the one hand, Barfield seems to think that the evolution of consciousness is just kind of unfolding out of yeah. our hands and is, you know, being uh, following Rudolf Steiner, he kind of gets this idea that history is kind of just unfolding and that this is going to happen. But then on the other hand, so there's if you if you think of it in terms of God, although I don't think Barfield uses the term of God's sovereignty, he wouldn't really speak that way. One of the things that's cool about Barfield, he's always just looking at how things are, or how they've yeah. been. He's not supposing like God is going to do something or he's just looking at things as they are, yeah. which I really appreciate because you can learn a lot from about God just by attending to reality like we've been talking about. But he seems to say, on the other hand, that the imagination, this is crucial to him, which we could we could talk about, um, is that he he sees the imagination as integral or a training of the imagination, which he gets from Steiner, but he also gets this from Coleridge, that this link, the imagination has something to do with moving us, like you say, into this next sphere. So into this next epoch or however one wants to describe it, of what, like you say, final participation, what does that look like? All that? I, I don't really know. I mean, yeah. he, guess. he didn't really fully articulate it, but um but yeah, so how much of a role do we play in that? Like, what is my role in all this? I think it is, a, it is I suppose, if I'm in the, I mean, he wasn't that close to the Inklings, but the Inklings would, of course, say, we do play a real role. And oh, by the way, God is sovereign. So it's, yeah. again, this yeah. very paradoxical, it's the Christian vision, you know, um, of aligning the will with God's will. One becomes most free. That doesn't sound like it makes any sense to us today, but it's kind of internal freedom. Um, plane is going over right now. Speaking of technology, <laughs> um, but uh, it's a kind of internal freedom that one has uh, in, in following the will of God. It doesn't make any sense today. That sounds constricting. It sounds like prison. Uh, but yeah, I think in his work, um, that's never really worked out. I think you're spot on to kind of point that out uh, that, and yeah, the role we play in that. For him, certainly, there's no doubt that we play a role in that. And that role has to do with the training of the imagination because the imagination exceeded reason for him. It, it brought reason up to its, um, um, it, it perfected reason kind of for him. Yeah. And so, and he gets this from all the romantics. Yeah. Uh, and there was a Coleridge that said, uh, imagination is, is reason in her reason, highest yep. mood in her. Yeah. Most exalted or highest mood. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So he's, th this is coming from all this. So how do we move beyond to the, the truths that we can't quite articulate? Well, you should use poetry. Uh, uh, another quote, I think it's Coleridge who says, prose is the best words this way uh then he says something that, oh, yeah the but, prose is the words the, is the words in the best order yeah poetry is the best words in the best order beautiful yes so it's the same kind of thing so if we're going to articulate this we should use uh poetry for these sorts of things um and, and so yeah and that that for barfield had to do with a, a training of the imagination to see differently that would bring in this new post kind of like alpha thinking period where we're dominative kind of like um but unlike the postmoderns 
Barfield believed you were really grasping something true. He wasn't mm-hmm. throwing truth out or metaphysics yeah. out. He had a very robust metaphysics. So his account of poetry and even the middle voice is very different than you get in like, I think it's Derrida who reads the middle voice as self-reflexive yeah. as if saying like you're talking about yourself. But for him, no, for Barfield, this is something you're receiving. I joke like when Austin Power says, allow myself to introduce myself. That's kind of the postmodern view of, of middle voice. Um, whereas for Barfield, it's much more, it, so it's still subjective, if that makes yeah. sense. But for Barfield, it's something more than that. And so, right, right. I, I think know. that is something that strikes me about Reed Barfield, that maybe you, you kind of imbibe a, that a sort of spirit of his confidence and that what he's engaging with is real. Yeah. Um, I don't know where he gets that confidence. Yeah. But I wish I had that kind of confidence. Yeah. He does. He's one of those people that stands in that lineage who's very clear, like this vision that I've been bequeathed to me and my Oxford education is a bunch of nonsense. Like yeah. you're all off. In fact, this guy named Rudolf Steiner is much more <laughs> onto something than you, which would have been absolutely appalling in that time. Yeah. Um, but I also think his link to language was so far ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, and he followed again in this, this kind of counter enlightenment tradition. Uh, and, 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 the, and this link to language was, was crucial, particularly in the critiques of, of Kant uh, as well, which he's quite critical of. Whether Barclay yeah. was aware of them or not, he knew to use language as a, as a starting point, which yeah. only now people seem to be catching on to. I don't know if you picked up on this, but I remember in, in Saving the Appearance, one, one of the things I found really interesting was because, you know, like, it, it's not, it's really unclear, you know, you, you mentioned he never says anything like God's sovereignty, right? He doesn't, he doesn't have a kind of God perspective no, on things. No, he's not, a, he's not talking theologically at all. But he, he, he notes that, you know, this sort of U-shape to, to going from original participation to whatever like extreme thing we're approaching now where we're getting it so far away from it that we almost can't even remember it or we can't yeah. like we it sounds nonsensical like uh to talk about it or as, as soon as it's brought up it's like okay well, that's that's clear nonsense you know that's what that's what you know primitive people think yeah. um but he, he makes the he makes the point in terms of the the history of the jews that it almost seems like God pushes them down that tract of away from original participation where all the, all the, the people around them are all worshiping the sun and moon and stars and they, they're yeah, engaging yeah, with yep. those spiritual realities. And it's like, no, you won't do this. Yes, you have yeah, to not yeah, do this. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and in a certain sense, you could say, you know, anybody that's a Jew today is, is like a long kind of, you could almost, it's almost like a Darwinian selection process. If you've stayed in it, you really held to that because you know, starting with the first exile and being, you know, thrown out of their own land, going to Babylon, and the fact that they retained an identity and and that their God, you know, was still real, even when they, because at that time, I guess, you know, in other books I've read, like, there was such a connection to your physical space you were in. And so if you left the land, it's like, well, your God lost, he's not real, like, he, wow. he was overthrown by the other the other people that conquered you, their God. But, but the Jews have a completely different narrative, which is they go on the exile and they're like, no, actually God did this to us because we weren't obeying him. Wow. He, he used your armies to, to like, so they, and, and it's just amazing to me, like, you know, even if you didn't believe in a sort of transcendent God that was working through history, like you'd have to look at the Jews and be like, what is, what is so unique about their perspective that they, they survived, you know, like what other iron age religions are around today? Mm-hmm. I mean, so it's, I don't know, something's going on there. So it seems like God is working something out in that, even though there is also this sort of negative consequences to this U-shape where we get so far away that we're, we're out of balance. But I don't know if, you, if, if that struck you at all or if you've, if you've thought about what, what, what is the good part of this, right? The, this sort of, because it, it, as you pointed out too, like even the enlightenment and all this, this, this empirical science, it, it, it has enabled a different, understanding of the world that in some sense is good it's enabled to do things that are pretty impressive there's some good in that but it's like um it's we've we've become kind of so um one-eyed 
in terms of how yeah, we can yeah. see things that we 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 forgot to integrate it. Yeah, that's all really important um, and insightful as well. That 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 question of what's going on there with the Jews as Barfield takes us up in saving the appearances in hit. And then, you know, how, how does that relate today to what we're seeing? Um, I think for Barfield and then uh, in his history of, of consciousness, the way he sees things, I think something to that, that kind of one could, one could kind of um, locate the centrality or the question of what is the evolution of consciousness with the idea of idolatry, which is what, what you're talking about, you know, mm -hmm. you worship the creature rather than the creator. And so this was happening to the Jews and Barfield kind of puts this within this his history of the evolution of consciousness. Um, I think I don't, it, for the listeners, um, the idea of uh, the evolution of consciousness goes something like this for Barfield in the, like you mentioned this in the past, if we look at primitives, they seem to think all things were kind of sacred. There's this constant intermingling, a, a word Barfield used, constant participation between spiritual things and material things, and you can never sunder them. You talked about the U-shape. Um, uh, all of a sudden in the modern period, I'm, I'm glossing over this very quickly, what we get now is this complete separation of those two. I go to church on Sunday, I go to work. Uh, during the week. Uh, that's the really Christian cheesy way of saying it. But like, there are times when I encounter God, but most of the time when I go out fishing or I'm just walking around, God is nowhere to be found in prayer. He shows up again. He, he kind of comes and goes. Mm -hmm. so this is the kind of like modern sort of framework that, that Barfield doesn't like. He thinks that this is a, an aesthetic way of viewing things that isn't like fitting with the contours of reality kind of like you said, um, but then he hopes, or he seems to think in final participation, um, this high rationalism that we developed would again marry this kind of romantic vision of things living in, in, uh, in a unique way, but in what way specific that is. And so, yeah, the question then of idolatry becomes very important because it has to do with how we see things. And again, here's this participatory vision of things that he sees in like primitives and in like the earlier earlier periods um um he's he's quite critical of aristotle i think he begins to see this vision he wrote in aristotle i yeah. wouldn't agree with him but but um well, i think i think maybe maybe more specifically aristotle's followers kind of yeah yeah and so but this I, idea of categorizing things like you said you brought up holism like sundering things and starting to split things apart comes full term in someone like Descartes where you see the, 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 the Cartesian dualism that we, we, we beat over the head all the time today if you're kind of interested in Barfield and, and this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so the question of idolatry, like how are we looking at things? Are we seizing them as things in themselves? That's idolatry. Forgetting that they're gifts. That gift is fundamental to a Christian vision of the world. So the moment we start to see things as ours, you see this in Lewis all the time, is seizing things as knowing and having control, this is a danger. This is idolatry, mine, precious, you know, Gollum, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. This is exactly what all the inklings are after. So yes, of course, God says, no, you shouldn't do that. You've forgotten about me. I'm going to take you on a journey, a pilgrimage, so to speak, so you can learn who I really am. And that unfolds, of course, over history. And of course, there's a million ways to read that. I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not a, an expert in, in Jewish or Hebrew literature or anything by uh, a stretch of the imagination. But the point is like, yeah, that's not the right way to see things. And so I'm going to show you how to see things. Um, and, and yet we kind of go on this, this phase of idolatry that, that, that it, for Barfield kind of represents the modern period the seizing of things, the calculating of things, a kind of forgetfulness of their, their givenness, the one, the mystery of like things just kind of appearing. They're just there. I'm here. We forget these sort of, um, it's a kind of a phenomenological reduction to, to materiality or however one wants to call it rather than letting things kind of be. And so the proper mode, again, all the way back to what you said at the beginning of iconography, is learning to see things as gifts from the creator 
rather than givens, I suppose. Hmm. So if you grasp, if we grasp reality as a gift, it changes the way that we treat things. It changes the way that we, um, you know, our way of being, the way we, we use things. Um, we should obviously think of humans that way. The prime example, again, is a child. We've really done nothing. You know, people got together. But, but, but aside from that, the, the creation of a child, I, I mean, I can't imagine. I'm not a father. But, you know, everyone who is says this is the most, like, amazing gift to be given. And um, a much, much more significant. And this is, again, back to the technology thing. If Amazon drops a package off at my house, I don't think much of it. But, you know, if someone goes out of their way that knows me, and even something as simple as a grandmother making something for us, there's something about that gift that we're going to have much more respect for. I can't order another blanket off Amazon that my grandmother gave me. So there's something about that givenness, that, not givenness, but that it is a gift. I'm going to treat it and view it with a sacredness that yeah. I wouldn't had it if I saw it as a given and replaceable. Yeah. And that's really the difference between a human kind of gift, a natural gifting, and a technological kind of gifting. It's irreplaceable. And yeah. so um, I think idolatry is the moment that we think things are replaceable or they are reduced to just their bare kind of uh, existence. Like I can replace that part in my car, just get another one. It's not the end of the world. It's just some money. The other example I use with students is my wedding ring. Like I can replace this ring. It probably costs four hundred dollars. I don't know. It's white. Gold. I hope it's white gold, not aluminum. You know, you never know. Um, uh, but it, you know, I can replace this, no doubt. But I'm always going to know it wasn't the one that yeah. my wife gave me on my wedding day. That there's something very significant. And this is tech, techne, but yeah. there's something significant about that because it's tied into the person who made it. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's kind of, I think, the proper perspective that the Christian, I think, that Barfield is onto when we go about our day, when we, when we see people, when we see the world, to see it as a gift from God. And so therefore, because it's a gift, I shouldn't use that blanket from my grandmother, you know, to change the oil in my car <laughs> when it gets older. I'm not going to do that with that blanket. I'm going to care for it. There's a certain end towards which it should be used. And I think attending, that's what idolatry fails to do is attend to that end, I suppose. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting that kind of jumped out to me too is, well, you know, th this contrast in my mind between like sort of a deistic model where in that model, God gives us the gift but then it's like he he completely goes away yes yeah Versus it's like a, a bad father like he sends you stuff on <laughs> christmas but it has no meaning because he just or, ordered it on amazon yeah or even even in my mode of thinking sometimes <laughs> you know it and i've even had kind of a, a sort of like negative thought or experience of this is that like well this we're just an experiment you know and and maybe there's a um, billion of them you know, running. And we're just like one of the ones he checks in on every now and then see, oh, did they, did they do anything interesting today? You know, like what's, what's going on? Experiment? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And so versus a sort of unfolding of reality that is bespoke and a gift for us specifically, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, this sort of, this sort of transjective mode that we talk about between the objective and the subjective, the middle voice is I, it's, it's, it's pointing towards God's participation in creation as well. Like that his movement towards us, that is specific and directed towards our view of the world, our consciousness, our what's in, what's salient and important to us now and, and use in speaking and, and intersecting through that mm -hmm. versus, you know, just like, Oh, here's some stuff. Go, figure out, see what you can do with it. See if you can go make some iPhones. Yeah, that's a really good way of thinking about it. I've never thought of 
deism along those terms of course distant god but as an experiment yeah like um it's not really relational is it it's kind of a, a come and go or even a transactional kind of relationship as opposed to something i'm learning about right now is that all of the all of creation is really an intimation of an unconditional love mm -hmm. like in a desire to be with uh, us in a drawing of us to that love um, yeah that's very different of a god uh, yeah in, in christ obviously a, a god who comes to be in fleshed with us in in, in in an intimate way then shines forth through all things in his drawing all things to himself ultimately in in that in the vision of unconditional love on the cross um that is kind of reflected in the vestiges of 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 creation to see things that way um requires for me a lot of i suppose healing of past dogmas um yeah. past understandings of god as um after retribution um as angry as uh that will take i suppose a lifetime for me um to make sense of and so that's still not i can talk about that but um like yeah. this, like we were talking about earlier having that go all the way down that's a different different question definitely and what well, i mean for me like i feel like this is where the both the incarnation and the cross become really important as evidence against um the that that we're an experiment right cuz cuz you know even in jesus and his humanity is is not a sort of temporary identification his 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 identity with humanity is permanent like it's 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 there in in the theological end of things as well um and in this the marriage between you know the church and 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 um and christ which which paul references as this kind of sort of great mystery um and so for me that's 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 really comforting as a sort of like okay this is this is rep so you know in, in jesus one of the things he always says throughout the gospels over and over again is like i can only do what i see the father doing so his his ministry his life and his death is is all a sort of revelation of who who the father is right yeah yeah and that that's his intent and like and they're like oh you know show us the father and he's like he's like don't you understand that everything i'm doing now is is an icon of the father yeah that's yeah. even what um you know i think paul in colossians calls him the icon the firstborn you know he's he's the incorruptible image of who god is and um so for me i i think one of the things that that I don't know if, if Barfield triggered this in me or even it was even prior to that, but it, it makes me ask certain questions about what, what does, what does God's involvement in creation, what does it cost him? What, what sort of, what, what does he of himself is, because you, you know, God's infinite and, you know, but, but his voluntary coming into relationship with the finite and this sort of working out of things over this, these long time spans, like what is, what is that, um, what does that cost of him? Cause I, I do think something of the cross is intended to illuminate God's cause I, you know, I don't, the model of love is a sort of giving up of oneself to another. Um, and so I, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, th th that to me like really struck me as, um, because again, my model of God was this sort of thing that created us and had opinions about us, but was, was very far off in some sense mm -hmm. not versus, versus this model in Barfield where it's like, he's in a, like any time I'm perceiving truth, I'm doing that in God, so to speak, or so there's yeah. something of God that's making it accessible to me in an actual movement of in, in disclosure of himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the self offering or self emptying or however one wants to articulate that is both like yeah, and a real 
metaphysical thing that occurs. I mean, mm -hmm. one of my supervisors described the incarnation both as historical, like he put a picture of the cross, drew a picture of the cross, but then had underneath it a, the, a timeline from like yeah. origin to end. Um, and, and he kind of said the incarnation is something like this, you know, so it spans all of history, the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. So right. on the one hand, this is a real historical event. Uh, and on the other, yet the world's been caught up in Christ since the beginning. Right. And so the, uh, John says this, um, but yeah. And so therefore like in a, in a real sense, that pivotal moment on the cross becomes the exist on the one hand the existential reality of unconditional love that is able to absorb all sin all our shortcomings all of our um all of the things that we should that should make us unlovable right like all mm -hmm. the things that would offend a real any any one of our relationships all the things we've done in secret and in and, and been exposed or um that is all absolved in that moment uh, david hart paints this really well that up until that point like we didn't have a conceptualization of that the gods had to be appeased in some way mm -hmm. and here is this kind of ultimate sacrifice where god comes in the flesh and says no no more no more um that says something about unconditional love that the sacrifices has, have ended and we in the eucharist remind ourselves of that gift over and over again the, uh, of that ultimate sacrifice and it somehow that becomes the real bread of life like you say it becomes the, the there's a reason the church is called the body of christ um and um yeah i think uh living that out and then understanding that in its fullness of what it is i'll never do i mean but um yeah there's a real sense in which that that moment is transformative but yet already kind of began at the creation if that makes sense i don't know if i'm answering your question yeah I, I, well i guess from my perspective you know like um it's important to me that the cross isn't a one-off because you know it on the scale of of uh you know creation you know God comes to earth, you know, dies on a cross. I mean, relatively speaking, you know, that's kind of like a, you know, for us, that's like a night in a bad hotel. I don't, I, I feel like I stole that from somebody, you know, right. You know, it, say, it sucked, yeah, yeah. but you know, you already knew it. You already knew everything was going to work out at the beginning. So like, okay, like, okay, like yeah, I, yeah. I'm back to my real life now. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't think that's what the cross is intended to be. Like, it, like it, there's, there's some sort of, yeah, cosmic, underpinning of of creation itself that is being illuminated specifically in 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 that life and death so. yeah and i and i think yeah i think you're exactly right i think in terms of thinking like what did god have to give up on that or what i think we often get caught up on that side of it but it's more about an expression of what god wants for us because mm -hmm. because we're never going to to know what what the other side you know, of it's why like. god did it that way or, or whatever i mean it, it is what it is mm -hmm. um but but to see it as an what what does it mean for us um it, i i think that it, it is easy to get caught up on that question of like what what did that mean for god what did he sacrifice did something change in god did um you know when god took on human flesh did he did something change uh and these are real questions to be asked um but uh I think the bigger question is like, what did it actually mean for, for us? Mm -hmm. um, that's a harder, I mean, that's the sort of, I suppose, spiritual question. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I wanted to, I know we're getting close to the end of our time and um, I wanted to go through that. You had a few really interesting quotes that you lead off your final chapter with um, from Chesterson, Balsasar and Kierkegaard. And I just wanted to go, through those, those three and, and get you to respond to what, how those, why you chose those and how they relate to kind of your conclusion. Uh, so the first one from Chesterton is the poet only asked to get his head into the heavens is the logician who seeks to get the heavens into his head and it's his head that splits. Yeah. So I, I Chesterton is, uh, uh, a brill, uh, so witty and, and brilliant. Uh, that is one. I don't know where I found that quote, but I thought it was really 
really great. Um, yeah. Um, it's kind of like a, I mean, that's what most theologians do, right? That's what my job is supposed to be is to, to bring, I, I suppose, to get wrap my head around heaven or something um, rather than, um, yeah, it being the other way around. It's sort of, it, it points to that, the, the thing of humility, I think that we've been talking about. And so, and it's a reminder, I think as a theologian that if I'm a theologian, I, I aspire to be, has something to do with the learned ignorance. Uh, Nicholas of Cusa uses that. Um, I think in a lot of disciplines, there is real growth to be had in knowledge, right? So in the sciences, or if I'm a biologist, there is real growth. And it's not to say that in theology, that's not the case, but transformation of the self, that's a different story. That has to do with, um, learned ignorance um that's kind of the thing that goes all the way back to what we were talking about like uh, humility uh so that's where that's why that quote i, I like that quote yeah awesome um so the next one's from baltazar and this this he talks about dialogicians then are philosophers who themselves need theology in order to develop their thoughts to completion yeah, that to me, I, I don't know what context is in, so I don't want to take it out of context. But to me, that kind of points to not just we're all dialogicians, right? We're all logicians in some way, uh, dialectic. We're trying to uh, sort things out. Like you say, you and I are both always going to kind of revert back to that. Um, now, am I saying that we should all be theologians, that theology would solve all the world's problems? No, in fact most theology I read is, is just repeating this same thing. It, it's, it's dialogicians. I, I suppose what I think of is that, is that I suppose you should place theology with God is would probably be a better way. The, the way that I'm thinking that through, like at some point, like we talked about that idea of rupture um, that brings us beyond our rational capacities yet is in a sense, very meaningful and rational at the same time. So that's how I think in terms of that. Okay. Um, and then the last one is from Kierkegaard. I, I found this really interesting because you, you use the phrase non-identical repetition mm -hmm. quite mm -hmm. a bit in the book. Um, and it, the quote goes like this, modern philosophy makes no movement. As a rule, it makes only commotion. And if it makes any movement at all, it is always within imminence. Whereas repetition is and remains a transcendence. Yeah, that that idea of non-identical repetition is, I've been working on a paper for a while on that. Um, I, I mean, literally like for like four years. And that by four years, I mean, I haven't gotten back to it in four years. Um, but I, that, that idea of non-identical repetition is something that John Milbank and kind of a lot of the people in the RO ethos really cue into as a paradoxical way of talking about movement or the relationship between history and eternal truths, uh, the relationship between form and matter. Um, and so the critique there that Kierkegaard scathing critique of kind of Hegel and Kant, and you can see this in his, um, the idea of the teleological suspension of the ethical in um, fear and trembling, the, the night of faith stuff, is that he, Kierkegaard, and why this is so appealing to someone like John is this paradoxical notion is how can you have non-identical repetition of something? And so for me, that's actually a, an account of all of reality. The, an idea that uh, it's platonic, but to me, it's also Christian, and it has something to do with the stability in flux of, of the world. So if, it, in other words, like everything is constantly changing, but, but yet at the same time, things are very fixed and we seem to be able to. So this is an account of reality that Kierkegaard had that then John picks up on. And I think it's quite necessary to have. It's a paradoxical notion that 
for well, you can just use a human for example we all know if we talk to scientists they would tell us like you and i change so much like our skin falls off our mind changes out let's think we develop we grow we grow bigger we change our hair color all, all these things are changing yet our identity is very fixed like when i come to talk to you again i know you're michael and you know that's a very basic example but even trees for instance the reason that we can recognize them through their change is because they they are yet uh identical yet uh repeated instantiation so the reason i'm able to call an oak tree an oak tree and not a a, a uh, a sunflower is because it is a kind of non-identical repetition of an oak tree uh it's identical to other oak trees but it's not it repeats that same essence but yet it's unique and so all of the world is kind of a non-identical repetition um and when kierkegaard's talking about movement he's saying you can't even recognize change unless there's both stability that carries through that change or form that carries through the change in matter um if that makes sense and so this is what kierkegaard was critiquing on the one hand hegel's notion of history as unfolding and constantly changing but then he was critiquing kant for trying to get at these uh, ideals and these transcendental kind of like fixities that one could know kind of universal truths and so he's suspending those two by saying no movement at all or the way things are is actually non-identical repetition of kind of like eternal truths and so this to me feeds into how we understand the relationship between history and dogma how we reinterpret things within the christian tradition within our time it seems to be the the, the tension between liberalism and conservatism um you know change cha utter change versus no change and it seems like so much of uh the world seems to 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 be caught up in in this dualism between the two and then kierkegaard saying no uh change and unchange uh state uh, are are fixed in um in all of creation uh if that makes sense uh there's much more philosophy behind it too but to me it's just kind of a vision of reality of what's called non-identical repetition that everything we look at shares and in, in, in participates in a particular uh unity uh a repetition of the sameness but it's non-identical from the other one um yeah so that that's what it's, that's, it's sort of I an articulation of the many and the one in yeah some the ex sense. that's exactly what it is it is a platonic concept of the one and the many and how it is that a universal can be caught up in so many instantiations of a particular um and it's by that universal that we recognize things like it's by that um repetition that sameness that we identify things as they are and by which we can be confident in our knowing of things um this is why barfield said that like once you lose that uh this is in his critique of kant like once you lose the idea that these essences or things are within they're they're within things this kind of sacramental vision as a christian might describe it then the he says the road is open to the madhouse like because if those things are not fixed stable within change then yeah we we ought to give up on all this altogether but it just doesn't seem to be the case we're still identifying things we're still having conversations we still seem to be able to make sense of people so clearly there are things that are fixed that we're able to grasp yet they exceed our grasp and that's kind of a platonic christian barfieldian vision of things i think awesome well i know we're getting right at the end here um I was curious, is there anything that you would like to plug here at the end? I know you're, you're currently engaged uh, working with the Martin Institute. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't have any need to plug anything. Yeah. I don't have anything to plug, but yeah, the gotcha. Martin Institute is, uh, is kind of dedicated to spiritual formation. Uh, it's at Westmont College in um, Santa Barbara, California. And um, it's kind of dedicated to the life and work of Dallas Willard in, in, um getting that message out of of that that formation and transformation in christ is is a real thing that people can we're not just kind of sitting around waiting uh until that day but that that can be had now the kingdom is is real and and something we can participate in now 
uh, and then it, it's kind of developing more broadly in, in other spheres. And so, yeah, I'm excited about what we're doing there. And um, I don't have anything else really exciting no. going on in my you life. You mentioned yeah. there was a conference next year that, uh, that might uh, yeah. be rescheduled. Yeah, I, I, we're not quite sure about that yet because of COVID. But yeah, sure. it, it looks like it's going to be a smaller symposium just to make sure. We're safe, but um, I'll, I'll get back with you if and when we, we hope to produce content from it so to share yeah. with others. But yeah, gotcha. it's kind of a, a yeah, a questioning, you know, what does Christianity or formation have to offer uh, um, our culture today? Um, does it have anything to offer or is it just an internal thing that, that we do? Yeah. Um, and, and so is Christianity just this thing inside us or is it something that tra really is transformative? I tend to think it is transformative, but how it is we go about doing that is, is, is much more challenging to articulate. Gotcha. And you, at one point you'd mentioned something called the Methexis Institute. Oh yeah. So is the Methexis Institute, it, yes, it is. It's um, what uh, John Milbank is the, I suppose the word would be principal of the, the center of theology and philosophy, which is based in England. That is a, a, a political, philosophical, theological, sociological, you know, all things you, you can involve yourself in a uh, think tank. Um, and there was a sense in which that needed to be translated <laughs> because even if you have a PhD, even I will struggle, even working with John for all these years, I'll be like, can you, can you repeat that again? <laughs> can you, uh, what was that name you just said? Like, I've never heard of that person. Um, it was an attempt, it is an attempt to articulate these things in a more common language. And so in May of, was it March or May of last year, we had our first conference in Charlottesville. That's what, Methexis means participation, by the way. And there was a sense in which, how do you get people to understand the very vision that you and I are, art, are articulating? Mm -hmm. And I suppose the best way of summarizing that would be it's an inklings kind of endeavor in a sense in which like, yeah, the whole world is very much alive um, with God. And, and, and um, we need to get out of the, the silo kind of mentality that God only exists in the church or in my spiritual life, but that he he's everywhere. And, and, and you can not only see him within other discourses, um, but all things are pointing to God. And so this vision that the, 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 all of creation is participating in God, again, that's a word that uh, folks in that movement would use to say, on the one hand, God is, you know, infinitely qualitative different, uh, infinitely qualitative different than, than creation, um, but yet near to. So participation is a word that in the Greek tradition was used to articulate that in a way that suspended both kind of dualism and pantheism like we talked about at the very beginning and so kind of uh finding ways to get this out um into broader spheres into the church um whether people are interested i'm not sure but um so is, is there anything ongoing that people can be um uh, we, look out we for? have a website but it's under construction right now so okay. when that comes up i'll i'll let you know and i don't know if you can link it to this um and yeah, so myself and the executive director, Aaron Jeffrey, uh, are, um, we're both literally in transition in our life. And, and at the same time, COVID hit. So we are just making sure that we um, have our ducks in a row to get the, the website back up in a very clear and substantial way. And, and once that goes, um, I'll let you know. Awesome. Well, I, I know you're, we're running out of time, so um, I'll let you go here. But I, I really appreciate your time, and uh, thanks for being so generous with it. I really appreciate Th that. Thank you so much. It's, your friendship is very meaningful. You know, we've talked twice before this, and um, I appreciate it. Uh, it's good to kind of do this. I've been in the middle of a move right now, living right now in Pennsylvania. I'm heading out west, and um, – it, uh, it, it's good to get involved, to have an academic conversation. I don't feel like I've had one for a little while. Um, I have them more along the lines of cultural spheres and Christianity a lot right now, but to have a full blown kind of like uh, academic conversation is, is a nice break for me. So I appreciate you. Yeah, certainly. And uh, hopefully we can, we can continue the dialogue and um, would love to love to see where you, where you go from here. Cool. Thank you so much, Michael. All right. Well, take care.
Goodbye. Bye.